It's a real pleasure tonight for me to uh, have the opportunity to introduce Bill Vogley. I've admired Bill since the time I first met him in the fall of 1980. At that time, I was a brand new graduate student. He, on the other hand, was at the end of that experience. He was in the final stage of writing a dissertation. We've both agreed that we are not going to tell stories about those days. I think I probably would have more to lose in that exchange. But at that time, Bill was a beacon of hope to those of us who were beginning the program. He was living proof that it was possible to complete a doctorate while maintaining your sanity. After he completed his PhD at Loyola University of Chicago, Bill moved on to New York City where he worked for 15 years as a program officer for the prestigious John M. Olin Foundation. Working in the world of philanthropy, however, never quenched his desire to think and to write. So eventually, he migrated to Southern California as a visiting scholar at Claremont McKenna College, just down the street. And ultimately, he moved into his current post, which is that of a senior editor at the Claremont Review of Books. Today, he is a prolific writer and blogger. His work appears, has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Christian Science Monitor, the City Journal, Commentary, First Things, In Character, National Review, and the New Criterion. And he also writes a blog in Ohio for the Ashbrook Center. Perhaps most notably, he is the author of a book entitled Never Enough, America's Limitless Welfare State. It is this book that sets the stage for his talk to us tonight entitled All Politics is Fiscal. When one reads the Federalist Papers or even the writings of the Anti-Federalists, you are left with the distinct notion that politics is all about ideas, ideas such as justice and order and liberty and equality. And that was largely true of almost everyone who thought and wrote about politics prior to the 19th century. Today, politics is mostly about money. One could argue that the blame should be laid at the feet of Adam Smith but it's probably more accurate to look at Karl Marx. Although in the US, Marxism never gained the traction that it found in Europe and in other parts of the world, the American experiment in self-government has turned, in uh, surprising ways, has turned every policy debate, both foreign and domestic, into an argument over spending, taxing, and borrowing. It seems as if it's all about the money. That development is the topic of Bill's book. The best teaser for Bill's book that I've encountered was written by James Pearson, president of the William Simon Foundation. He wrote, Bill's insightful and well-crafted book explains why Americans are at once dissatisfied with their welfare state, yet apparently willing to see it grow without limit. And also why the long-running debate between liberals and conservatives over the welfare state has produced ever more confusion about who should benefit and who should pay. Vogley, however, manages to frame this argument in a new way and to show how liberals and conservatives can get beyond their fruitless debates in order to place the American welfare state on a more effective and affordable footing. Never Enough is that rare book that makes a new contribution to an old debate and has something important to say to both liberals and conservatives. Please join me in welcoming Bill Vogley. Good. It's nice to see you all here today. I know we're, you're on semesters at APU, correct? So there's about not even a month to go. 
So the chance to sit in yet another room and hear yet another person talk is not necessarily the most enticing offer that's been made to you. Um, so it's, it's really nice to see you. So the, the title I've given my talk is All Politics is Fiscal. Uh, many of you will recognize this uh, if you've studied some recent American uh, political science or history. Um, is a reference to an aphorism made famous by uh, Thomas O'Neill, Tip O'Neill, he was known uh, as university, uh, universally. He used to say, all politics is local. Does that phrase strike a bell? Yeah, so. um, now, O'Neill died um, almost 18 years ago. Uh, but he had a fascinating career in American politics uh, that deserves to be studied and remembered. He was an elected official for exactly half a century, winning a seat in the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 1936 and retiring uh, from the U.S. House of Representatives after a decade as Speaker in 1986. The, as it happens, the arc of those 50 years meant that uh, O'Neill, an ardent Democrat, came in at um, high tide and went out at low tide. Uh, he won his first election in 1936, the year voters endorsed the New Deal by giving the Democratic president, Franklin Roosevelt, a landslide victory in which FDR failed to carry only Maine and Vermont. O'Neill wrapped up half a century in politics by winning his last election to a 17th term in Congress in 1984, the year voters overwhelmingly reelected the Republican president, Ronald Reagan, who failed to carry only Minnesota and the District of Columbia. Reagan himself, some of you may know, had been a New Deal Democrat. He voted for FDR uh, in four presidential elections. By the time he got out of show business into politics, however, Ronald Reagan challenged more successfully than any other conservative politician the justice and feasibility of perpetuating and enlarging the New Deal's commitment to activist government. In saying that all politics was local, Tip O'Neill was not offering a political scientist's a neutral assessment he was instead speaking as a partisan Democratic politician, the most important in the country from 1980 to 1986, when he was Speaker and Ronald Reagan was President. O'Neill was pushing back against Reaganism. He was insisting that even if Americans had become dubious about activist government in general, they were still good New Dealers when it came to the particular benefits their states, cities, neighborhoods, and ultimately their own families could receive from government programs. Reagan and O'Neill, the two antagonists of the 1980s, fought to a draw. Government spending on social programs grew more slowly under Reagan than any other modern president but he made very modest headway on the promise announced in his 1981 inaugural address to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment. At the same time, the nation remained so wary of government's ambitions that two years after O'Neill's death in 1994, a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, found it necessary to declare at the start of his own reelection campaign the era of big government is over. Well, that turned out to be incorrect in one sense, but may be coming true in another. Uh, I would like to do two things uh, in the time remaining before we open the discussion up for some questions and answers. Uh, first, I want to give an overview of how, America, uh, how government in America has grown and changed since World War II. And second, I want to sketch out an argument that in an age when all politics is fiscal, Bill Clinton's pronouncement about the era of big government being over may, 15 years after he made it, finally becoming true. Uh, 
A good way to discuss the growth of government is to concentrate on government spending. It's not a perfect way. Uh, since what government spends is only a part of what government does, the costs and benefits of uh, government regulations do not show up on the government's books, but are nonetheless real and important. Uh, if the federal government wants to help the working poor, for example, it could expand the earned income tax credit, a kind of negative income tax. Uh, doing so will increase the amount of money the government spends. Alternatively, the government could raise the minimum wage. That policy change will not show up on the government's ledgers, but will be an instance of the government using its regulatory power to require some people, employers, to transfer wealth to other people, their lower paid employees. The advantage of talking about government spending is that it's uh, relatively easy to quantify and compare while the costs and benefits created by regulations are woven into our economy and, as a result, far more difficult to measure. With that disclaimer, then, let's go ahead and look at some spending data. <gasps> it happened. Good. <laughs> um, uh, we see here that uh, total government spending doubled in relation to gross domestic product the standard measure of an economy's total output between 1948 and 2010. Uh, I use those dates because the, um, uh, the numbers here are derived from historical tables from the Office of Management and Budget. These are the tables that accompany each year's new presidential budget. Um, and if you're nerdy enough, you can download these tables as spreadsheets and then sort of unpack them to find out what's been going on with uh, government spending. Um, the OMB historical tables go back as far as 1940 for the purposes of detailing federal spending, but only to 48 for giving an aggregate total for all state and local government outlays throughout the country. Uh, total government spending amounted to 17.1% of GDP in 1948 and 35% in 2010. The ratio between federal spending on the one hand and all state and local spending on the other has fluctuated a bit, but basically been about two to one over these 63 fiscal years. In 1948, state and local spending accounted for 5.5 percent of GDP and federal spending accounted for 11.6 percent, two to one. In 2010, state and local spending equaled 11.1 percent of GDP and federal spending equaled 23.8 percent, a bit more than two to one. Whatever else is going on then with the era of big government not being over, it isn't the story of a dramatic shift in spending within our federal system. The national government has not been growing at the expense of the state and local ones or vice versa. Rather, all levels of government have been growing. 18 GDP percentage points that were roaming happily in, on their own in 1948 have bit by bit been brought into the public sector corral uh, where six of them were branded by our state and local governments, and the other 12 were claimed by the federal government. So what accounts for this doubling over 63 years inclusive? Uh, two things. First, American government in 2010 did many of the same things it was doing in 1948, but did them more extensively and more expensively. Uh, we had paved roads in 1948. Uh, we had police and fire departments, uh, public schools and colleges, prisons, courthouses, and so forth. Uh, we have all those things now, too, but we uh, have more of some of them. Uh, a much higher percentage of Americans in their late teens and early 20s go to college now than did so 60 years ago, for example, or, or as far as that goes, finish high school. Uh, and many of them uh, either go to public colleges or go to private colleges with uh, some sort of uh, government help in terms of loans or grants or, or uh, loan guarantees. In the public schools, the teacher-pupil ratio is higher than it was in 1948, and the schools have many more administrators and counselors than they used to. Also, 
public employees have higher salaries, better fringe benefits, and better pensions than they did in 1948, all of which increases government spending. <clears throat> the second thing that explains the growth of government spending is that American government today does a lot of things it didn't do in 1948. Most of these new undertakings are social insurance and welfare programs. Disability insurance, for example, wasn't added to the Social Security system until 1957. Medicare, a purely federal program, and Medicaid, which both the federal and state governments spend money on, were great society programs enacted in 1965. Put these two trends together, spending more money on the stuff government has always done, and then spending money on tasks government only recently started to take on, and you wind up with government spending accounting for twice as large a portion of GDP in 2010 as it did in 1948. A very important part of the story of the growth of government, however, is the changing composition of government spending. We can see that changing mix here. The blue band at the bottom of this graph is all state and local government spending. The three bands above it account for all spending by the federal government. Um, so despite the technicolor effect, this, this graph has the same silhouette as the last one. It shows the same rise in government spending. Uh, it just breaks the components down. Um, National defense spending, um, in purple up there at the top, is federal spending on the Pentagon and the various intelligence agencies. Human resources spending, in green, is federal spending on the five big areas of the welfare state. Uh, those are, one, Social Security, the federal government program for um, retirees. Two, all other government federal government programs um, of income transfers or income support, such as unemployment compensation or disability insurance. Three, Medicare, the, the federal program that provides medical insurance, essentially to people who are 65 and older. Four, all other federal government programs in the area of health, Medicaid, the S-CHIP program, a relatively new development, um, the National Institutes for Health, and then five, all programs that the federal government spends money on for education, job training, social services. These five areas together constitute the heart of the American welfare state. And this term human resources is the uh, sort of blanket that the OMB throws over all of this kind of spending in its historical tables. And then finally, there's a federal everything else spending. Uh, that covers what you might call the federal government's uh, housekeeping expenses. Um, everything else, the, the red band above the blue one, uh, includes um, national parks and forests, federal courts and prisons, uh, our embassies and consulates around the world, interstate highways, AM traffic, Amtrak, the air traffic control system, um, all the other services and activities that sort of keep the federal government running. The big story that this four-color graph tells is the steady shift over more than half a century of federal spending from national defense, the purple, to human resources, the green. We can see that shift better by looking at the two kinds of federal spending in isolation. At the height of the Korean War in 1953, the federal government was spending 14% of GDP on national defense, and only 2% on human resources. Even as late as 1959, when we, there were many Cold War tensions, but we weren't actually in a shooting war with the Soviet Union or any proxies around the world, we were still spending 10% of GDP on national defense and 4% on human resources. Since then, however, national defense spending has never again surpassed 10% of GDP, not even when we had over 500,000 troops in Vietnam in the late 1960s. Uh, 
As defense spending declined, human resources spending increased. In another view of the same data, we can see that the lines crossed in 1971 when we spent 7.6 percent of GDP on human resources and 7.3 percent on national defense. These long-term trends were interrupted moderately and temporarily under President Reagan when defense spending increased and human resources spending was reined in. By the end of Bill Clinton's presidency in 2000, however, we were spending 3 percent of GDP on national defense and almost four times that amount on human resources. Um, since 9-11, we've added the better part of two GDP percentage points to defense spending and added about four GDP points to human resources spending, most of it in the last two years as a result of the recession and the policies of a Democratic president and Congress. Uh, I thought it was important to walk through these numbers about the changes in federal spending because you sometimes hear uh, liberal politicians and writers say that conservatives who complain about the growth of government are making a mountain out of a molehill. Their argument is that federal spending as a percent of GDP fluctuated in a very narrow band between 17 and 23 percent in the half century after Dwight Eisenhower was reelected to a second term in 1956. So government really hasn't grown all that much. Uh, and that's true as far as it goes, but doesn't go far enough to recognize that the part of federal spending liberals and conservatives argue about most, human resources spending or simply the welfare state, has grown dramatically by spending about six GDP percentage points that used to be devoted to national defense and a few more besides. The federal government spent 15.7 percent of GDP on human resources programs in 2010, more than twice as big a proportion of the entire economic output as the federal government spent 40 years before that. There is another consideration that doesn't make its way into the argument that the government in general and the welfare state in particular haven't really grown all that much. It is that not all GDP percentage points are created equal. We are much more populous and much more prosperous country than we were 25 or 50 years ago. We see that per capita gross domestic product adjusted for inflation has grown at a rate that works out to 2 percent annually over the past 63 years. Uh, we see also because there's so little daylight between the trend line and the actual numbers that uh, this is not only a, a sort of an average trend but it's a pretty good descriptor of the um, of any given year if you guess that that the uh, per capita constant dollar GDP was going to grow 2 percent, you never would have been wrong by much uh, between 1948 and 2010. Um, compound interest, the saying goes, is the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, an economy that grows after inflation and population change at an annual rate of 2 percent will double every 35 years, which means it will quadruple every 70 years. And if this is a word in the dictionary, octuple every 105 years. Um, we need to adjust our perspective then to take account of the fact that uh, even despite the bad recession and the slow recovery we're enduring in uh, the year 2011, America is a far more prosperous nation than it was even two or three decades ago. That 15.5 percent of GDP the federal government spent on human resources programs in 2010 isn't, therefore, twice as much as the 7.6% it spent in 1971. When you adjust for inflation and population growth, it's almost four times as much. To find out when federal human resource spending per American adjusted for inflation was half as much as it had been in, in 2010, we don't need to go all the way back to 1971, but only to 1989. We can see here that there have been some surges 
and plateaus, but basically, welfare state spending has grown steadily and immensely over the past 63 years. If, indeed, I built my spreadsheets correctly, we're looking here at an annual growth rate compounded <clears throat> of 5.8%, which means federal spending on human resources doubles in a little over 12 years, quadruples in about 25, and increases by a factor of eight over 37 years. It also means that real per capita welfare state spending is growing almost three times as rapidly as real per capita GDP. Well, as the late economist Herbert Stein used to say, if something can't go on forever, it won't. The biggest thing modern government now does cannot go on forever, growing at three times the rate of the economy that sustains it. And this is where the idea that we are entering what is likely to be a long era when all politics is fiscal comes into play. Today, the fundamental problem of figuring out how much government we want and how we're going to pay for it pervades politics at the national, state, and local levels. And it is at least as urgent around the world as it is here in America. When all politics was local, the dominant reality was that people liked big government benefactions and wanted them to continue and increase. When all politics is fiscal, an even more fundamental reality prevails. It is no longer enough to ask whether people like it when government gives things to them and does things for them. That's the easy part. Both logic and experience demonstrate conclusively that governmentally conferred benefits are indeed very popular and extremely difficult to eliminate or scale back. The crucial question, however, becomes whether people like big government's endeavors enough to pay for them. There are two ways to pay for what government does, borrowing and taxing. The reason to suspect that 15 years after President Clinton announced it, the era of big government might finally be starting to come to an end is that we seem to be running into the political and economic limits on how much the government can borrow and how much it can tax as we watch the generous welfare states of Europe, the models for what American liberals dream of building here, struggle with sovereign debt crises, it becomes clear that there really are limits, ones not far off in the distance, to our ability to borrow our way out of the disparity between what we demand from government and what we are willing to surrender to it. As a result, the answers America gives to the questions of how and how much we want to be taxed is going to decisively shape the answers to the questions of what we want the welfare state to do and not do. Um, I am, as you might have um, doped out already, uh, politically uh, conservative, uh, which means a couple of things. Um, first, uh, I would like to see this tension between the big welfare state Americans want assisting them and the much smaller one they're willing to pay for resolved by curtailing spending rather than increasing taxes. Uh, such a resolution would not involve dismantling the welfare state or repealing the New Deal, but could and should entail bringing the welfare state's growth rate in line with the underlying economies. Such a welfare state will be bigger in a decade or a century than it is now, but it will not claim an even an ever larger percentage of GDP. In 2010, our federal, state, and local governments spent $5.08 trillion. Uh, it's difficult to believe that they were all spent on their best and highest uses, rendering futile efforts to achieve greater efficiencies or to shift money towards more urgent needs by reducing or eliminating programs that address less urgent ones. The other thing about being a conservative is that it means uh, I am basically a pessimist. Um, 
I like uh, George Will's uh, adage that uh, uh, the good thing about being a pessimist is that most of the time you're right and the rest of the time you're pleasantly surprised. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, very famously, William Buckley, in the first issue of uh, National Review magazine in 1955, wrote, we stand athwart history yelling stop, um, which is the battle cry of the side that expects to lose valiantly, not the one that's confident everything's going to work, work out just fine in the end. Um, however, I, I try to read at least as many books and articles by people on the left side of the political spectrum as I do from those on the right. And I'm struck by the fact that uh, these days they're pretty pessimistic too. To take just one example, uh, <laughs> um, Ron Klain, um, who was uh, chief of staff for Vice President Gore back in the 1990s and then quite recently for Vice President Biden, um, recently wrote in a, uh, a column he has now for the Bloomberg uh, and, uh, press enterprise, um, that the tax issue has been kryptonite for Democrats in recent decades, and the danger it poses for them going forward remains severe. Um, his party's core political problem, according to Klain, is that the necessity for more revenue is being weighed in an environment that is highly skeptical of government's ability to use that revenue wisely. Or, as Jerry Brown, our current and former governor, um, recently said in a New York Times interview, if you talk about taxes, you don't get elected. So that's a non-starter now. Well, it's not clear when, uh, how, or whether taxes will ever turn into a starter for Democrats. The dog that doesn't bark in American politics is the sound of shrewd, ambitious Democratic politicians giving speeches about how big tax increases that most of us have to pay will fund expanded government programs that leave our country much better off. The deafening silence created by the absence of such arguments is evidence of Democrats' morose conviction that Americans don't like their party's agenda enough to give it the only endorsement that really matters, voting to pay for it. Until the American public becomes more receptive to higher taxes, or Democrats devise more ambitious and successful means of persuading them to accept such taxes, it may be that liberals' pessimism is, for a change, more justified than the gloom that comes naturally to conservatives. Um, on that, uh, which is for me a uh, hopeful note, I think I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention and offer to uh, uh, answer any questions or listen to any observations that you might have. Thanks. What are the alternatives to, this is sort of a you know, sort of technical thing, what are the alternatives to measuring the growth of government uh, alternatives, that is, to measuring it against the GDP. Uh, does that doesn't even make sense to you? I mean, that, it's always, uh, um, why do we turn that way? Or Anyway, that's yeah. a starter. Well, I, um, the, you're right. That's, that's the sort of default option, the one people do most. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, a road less taken is the one I've tried to work into this talk a little bit, into, into never enough a little bit, which is to talk about um, um, constant dollar per capita expenditures. Um, uh, because, uh, to reiterate one, one of the points I, I just made, I think it's important um, not to lose sight of the fact that over long periods of time, the, the economy changes usually for the better, um, so that um, um, we are, um, uh, um, the, the, to put the point another way, the growth of the welfare state is, is um, a sort of a, a two-part phenomenon. Um, the, the pie represented by GDP, by, by economic uh, output, has grown steadily, not just in the United States, but really in all industrial democratic nations since World War II. 
And then the slice of the pie that's sort of taken up by welfare state expenditures has also grown. So it's, um, uh, it's more out uh, 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 a bigger economy and a bigger claim on that economy. Um, the, um, uh, and, and this has some, some interesting and, and uh, counterintuitive implications. Um, on, a, on a per capita constant dollar basis, um, welfare state spending, as I've defined it, human resources spending, um, grew while Ronald Reagan was president. But it, that, that came about not so much as because of a political failure as an economic success. The portion of total GDP um, uh, used for the purposes of human resources spending declined between 1981 and 1989, Reagan's first and last years in the White House. But that decline was off, more than offset by the growth in the economy. So even though in 1989 the government was spending less on the programs Ronald Reagan and the Republicans wanted it spending less on, the economy had grown so much that it was still spending more in absolute terms, adjusted for population, adjusted for inflation, than it had been when, when Ronald Reagan was inaugurated. Um, so it's, it's sort of the, the, the situation of somebody trying to, um, uh, to uh, w walk downstairs on an escalator that's going upstairs. Uh, uh, they, they went pretty fast. They still wound up farther away from their goal than when they started. Um, so uh, there may be other ways to do this, um, but they, they, they need better statisticians than I am to sort of dope, or better economists, you know. Um, to, to me, the, um, these two things, one just relative to GDP, other in, in sort of absolute terms, um, seem like the best ways to go about it. Um, uh, you say America is different in reference to than Europe, and then you say, uh, Lipset quotes the political scientist Walter Dean Burnham, no feudalism, no socialism. With those four words, one can summarize the basic sociocultural realities that underlie American electoral pol politics in the industrial era. European conservatives welcome government intervention to uphold traditions and unify society. They look on American conservatives with their attachment to Liz Fair as champions of modern history's most convulsive force, uh, capitalism. And um, my question, I thought that was a really astute observation, but my question to that was, so does then New Deal ideology, um, does it, and furthermore, will it ever have the chance of being successful of subverting this American skepticism of big government? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it does make sense, which isn't to say that I have an answer, um, but it, um, uh, I, I think it's a very hard question, and I, I think um, it will, you'll have a better time when you're my age than I do now, because we're, we're really starting to see kind of push come to shove in these social policy debates. Um, the, uh, the reason why the debates, such as the ones happening this month in Washington in this congressional super committee trying to figure out how to rein in the federal deficit over the next decade, um, the reason why they're so intense, so politically charged, is that the, um, uh, in a sense, both the New Deal and the counter or anti-New Deal template for what America ought to be are both sort of on the line. Um, the, the, uh, the Democratic vision, the capital D Democratic Party vision, is that, um, yes, they're, they're very uh, hesitant about, uh, Democratic politicians are about going to the American people and saying um, what would seem like the most sort of straightforward endorsement of the New Deal framework and paradigm to say to the American people, look, the stuff we want the government to do, it's really, really important. It'll make America a much better place, not just for the people who happen to be beneficiaries of particular programs, but for all of us. It will bring about decently shared prosperity and greater social harmony. Um, we'll be happier as Americans once we implement this full kit. Um, therefore, the, the taxes necessary to pay for it, nobody likes paying taxes, we understand that, but the taxes necessary to pay for it are really a good bargain. They'll leave us all better off. You should, you should endorse those taxes. Unwilling or unable um, to make that argument, Democrats' sort of fallback hope is that um, the disparity between what the government has promised to do and the set of expectations it is 
left the people with about how much, how big a sort of tax burden they're going to be asked to bear will be resolved by the American people saying, holy moly, are you saying that if we don't have big tax increases, you're going to, you're going to start cutting all these government programs that we get, you're going to start cutting student loans, you're going, to, uh, you're going to do what Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin recommends in his budget plan, which is to turn Medicare from a defined uh, benefit program into a defined contribution one, and people are going to get vouchers for, their, um, for shopping for private insurance rather than a uh, sort of ironclad guarantee from the government to take care of their medical bills. That really sounds scary. We don't want that. Therefore, reluctantly, um, but uh, realistically, we will, uh, to prevent a sort of dramatic re rebuilding, restructuring of the welfare state, we will um, acquiesce to big tax increases to keep it going in pretty much the shape we've all known it since the uh, 1930s. The Republican hope is that uh, when people uh, find out the size and extent of the tax increases need, needed to keep the federal government operating in, a, in the shape it has been, they're going to say, oh my gosh, that much money? My paycheck is going to be that much smaller to keep this thing going? No, out of the question. Cut the programs, change things around, do whatever you need to do. We, on no circumstances are we going to sign up. This is not just a little bitty increment we're talking about. This is a big hit. We don't want that. Um, so in a sense, your question is, which of these two things is going to prevail completely or mostly? You know? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and I think it's, it's an important question. It's, it's, um, it's a small d democratic question in the sense that the future of the country is not going to be decided by politicians and columnists and people who talking heads on TV. It's going to be decided by ordinary citizens. It's going to be decided by how they vote in the next two, three, four election cycles. That really determines whether the New Deal framework is, by and large, affirmed or, by and large, um, uh, placed in a position where it is uh, uh, impossible for it to continue without big changes. I think we reached 15 trillion for borrowing. Uh, for the U.S. government? Um, I, yeah, I don't know what the total is. So you're, that's the national debt yeah, we're talking about. Debt. That's so right. I was curious what lessons we can learn from uh, the Euro and Europe if, and also their stats on how their social um, welfare compared with their GDP. Any, yeah. Any concrete stats on that? Yeah. Well, um, I did in, uh, in the first chapter of Never Enough um, – uh, look at some data from the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development that compares a dozen or so different modern industrial countries. Um, the the um, uh, in in one sense, the American welfare state is is um, uh, rudimentary compared to just about every other country in the world. We we devote a smaller share of our GDP um, to those purposes than most of the countries of Europe, then Japan, then Australia, then Canada. This, this sort of goes back to your question, Chris. However, in another sense, um, the American welfare state is kind of in the middle of the pack by virtue of the fact that because per capita GDP is bigger in the U.S. than it is in, e even in countries that we think of as, as prosperous, you know, the Netherlands, France, Japan, uh, Australia, um, it's smaller enough in those countries that in some cases the bigger proportion of their economies they devote to the social welfare spending allows them on a per capita constant dollar basis to exceed the U.S. and in some cases to fall short. Um, the, um, I, you know, I used to, when, I, when the book first uh, came out about a year and a half ago and the um, the publicity uh, department at Encounter Books was setting me up with a lot of radio interviews, most of which were on drive time morning programs on the East Coast, so I'd set the alarm for 4.15 and then have to get up and speak uh, conversantly and glibly and knowledgeably about GDP rates. <laughs> it was a nightmare. Um, I, I used to say, well, look, um, 
there, there are sort of uh, two ways that American conservatives like me can think about the, the uh, uh, European social democracies, the welfare states there. One way is to say that, um, that this is a paradigm that just doesn't work anywhere. And that instead of Americans sort of following the advice, the urgings of um, liberals here, who want us to, in effect, Swedenize our political economy, uh, whereas we have 35% of GDP devoted to all government spending in Sweden, it's 55%. Um, the, the correct answer is, in fact, this is the sort of the, the, the hard conservative position, um, that Sweden ought to be Americanizing. It ought to be reducing its welfare state and getting rid of the um, um, uh, uh, programs it has. I, uh, some of you may read um, the, the very acidic writer Mark Stein in National Review, National Review Online, other points. Um, he was talking about the European welfare state the other day. He said, um, he said, if a thing cannot be done at all, it's pointless to have a debate about whether it can be done well, how it can be done well. He said, the thing that the European welfare states are trying to do, which is to create a society with large and growing numbers of 37-year-old college students and 52-year-old retirees, cannot be done at all. Um, and um, we should not be seeking to emulate this. The, um, the, the uh, less uh, sort of categorical conservative position on this question is that, um, well, you know, um, America is a different place. This, this gets back to your question a little bit. We have a different political heritage. There's never been a feudal past here. There's always been a, a sort of a don't tread on me cussedness that's part of the American character. So maybe the, the, maybe the answer is that um, the social democratic model is more or less well suited to the European sociological and political realities, but simply won't fly here. Um, that um, that in countries where people um, are less uh, tetchy about standing in line and being told to fill out these forms in triplicate, um, that. Um, uh, that a New Deal sort of framework, maybe that'll work, but not in the U.S. For a long time, I, was, I thought that the second answer maybe was the stronger one. But as, as, as I look at what's been happening in Europe um, in the you know, year and a half since, since Never Enough came out, I didn't, I didn't really discuss th these phenomena very much there. Um, I, I guess I've been feeling more and more that maybe the, maybe the more encompassing conservative critique of the social democratic project is correct. Uh, and, and I think if so, then the basis is that it, it seems to be that, that the, the, the big government project, whether in the, no matter what hemisphere you, you carry it out in, it, it suffers from the same um, all politics is fiscal defect, which is no matter um, how much more willing the Swedes are than we are to pay taxes for government programs, they remain less willing to pay for those programs than they are to partake of the benefits being offered by the programs. And this seems to be like the constant that connects every one of these countries. There is this uh, constant built-in tendency for government spending to run several GDP percentage points above uh, government taxes. Um, so no matter um, how convincingly you sell this argument, well, you know, we'll, we'll be better off if we have these taxes. You don't, you never sell it convincingly enough to pay for the stuff the government commits itself to doing. So you owe, this is, this is truly a chronic built in the, the um, uh, recipe sort of uh, uh, permanent deficit. Um, Mademoiselle. It's actually kind of pertains to what you're talking about with, um, a little bit of like the European standards of like living, but um, do you see a parallel, I put it down because I would forget, do you see a parallel between the expansion of the government with the New Deal and then the expansion of the government with the Affordable Care Act if it were to pass, and then how does this fit into um, Clinton's statement of big government kind of subsiding a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, it's, um, I, I, 
There's, there's a few, that, that's a good question, uh, which is what I always say when I don't really have an answer. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, certainly one of the reasons the uh, Affordable Care Act was so controversial, remains so controversial, uh, just today maybe you saw there was a, there's another new poll out indicating that still, uh, this is now, um, what, uh, almost two years after it, it passed Congress, um, that um, a plurality of Americans would like to see it uh, repealed. Um, uh, Democrats, uh, when it when those poll numbers were so bad in 2009 and early 2010, Democratic consultants promised the politicians, "Don't worry. Once it's enacted, it will be a lot more popular. People, um, it will save us at the 2010 elections." They said. Um, I th I think that part of the unpopularity of the Affordable Care Act is that um, people resented what struck some voters, not um, swing voters, not necessarily um, down the line Republicans, as the sort of doctrinaire nature of that enterprise. Uh, that here we had the, the, the uh, country in a terrible state of affairs, a, a bad recession, um, um, a financial panic, a lot of people out of work. Um, working on that should have been sort of the, the first thing that the president and the Democratic Speaker of the House and the Democratic Senate Majority Leader were thinking about every day and the thing that was at the top of their uh, priority list all throughout. And instead, and this is where I think it, it, it was a, a politically damaging to, to the Democrats, uh, it seemed like they had this big item on their to-do list left over from going all the way back to the New Deal, Harry Truman tried to get this through. Lyndon Johnson had to sort of settle for just Medicare rather than a bigger program. Bill Clinton famously devoted the first two years of his presidency um, to uh, um, uh, passing some sort of national health insurance. And, and so there was this feeling that, um, uh, that the, 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 the uh, governing party was preoccupied with um, fulfilling a part of its ideological agenda at the expense of um, addressing the, the country's most obvious and most urgent need. So I, I think that was a problem. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, what uh, has not come true so far may yet come true um, if uh, uh, either the Supreme Court or a future Congress does not um, undo most of the Obamacare Act, then we will indeed have, have uh, reached a point where um, the government has taken on a, a, a vast new responsibility that, that previously was sort of, uh, I mean, certainly it's, it's not the case the government was, was uh, absent from the field of health care. It was present in all sorts of ways. But this carves out a much bigger uh, field of responsibility for it. Um, one. Um, what, and, and so the question will be how people feel about that. And I think this goes back to the question sort of of the American character. Um, uh, if, uh, um, if, if grandma can't get that hip replacement surgery because the independent payment advisory board that is supposed to be the great money-saving vehicle woven into the Affordable Care Act um, says that she's too old, uh, her, her um, various uh, determinative criteria don't make this a cost-efficient use of the government's money and under Medicare. Um, I could envision people getting upset about this. Um, uh, and it would seem like a sort of a Pyrrhic victory for the Demo capital D Democratic cause then, because they would have put the, this new government um, uh, endeavor in line to make people angry all day, every day, about a million different decisions. Um, but if indeed um, people, by one means or another, sort of get around to, ex not necessarily loving or even liking, but sort of accepting um, a, a federal government uh, acting in the area of health care to the extent and along the lines of those portrayed in, in uh, laid out in the Affordable Care Act, uh, then it would be a, a, a big uh, advance for the, um, I guess you would say, sort of the New Deal project. It would um, it would take it to a level that that 
uh, Democrats have been hoping now for the better part of a century to attain and, and uh, finally reach. Uh, one sort of um, 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 strange question that comes from that is whether um, by virtue of having checked that last big item off the to-do list, um, whether, uh, wh where does liberalism go from there in America? Um, because it, it seems like that, that all that's left, sort of, is to um, do little marginal elaborations of things that are already in place. I, I, there are some people who think, well, the next big thing, then, is child care. That's, that's another big difference between the uh, Scandinavian social uh, democracies in America, that they have um, uh, an extensive network of government uh, operated or subsidized uh, ch daycare centers. And the, the sort of normal family model is for uh, mom or dad to drop the kids off, go do their careers, come back. We, uh, the American network is much more sort of haphazard and, and, and patched together. So that, you know, you could do that and add a few more uh, points, GDP points, to the government ambit. Um, but I don't know. Um, speaks a little bit more to the American character. Yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, human resources spending um, is increasing at basically three times the rate of GDP per capita. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that's happening, whether that's um, something that has to do with the American character and our, our need for more, more care in that way? Um, I know at the founding, one of the um, key principles of the founders was that um, families and churches and local communities would take care of those in need. And can you talk maybe a little bit about the breakdown of that and maybe if that has something to do with um, all this human resources spending. And then um, to tag along with that, um, how can we, if, if it's inevitable that this um, increases, mm -hmm. how can we make it more efficient? I know you mentioned um, possibly spending, um, human resources spending relative to the GDP. So as GDP increases, we increase yeah. spending and vice versa. So. Um, Thank you. Sure. Well, don't thank me yet. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think that um, um, the uh, th this uh, I'll, I'll venture a, a very uh, um, controversial uh, and um, esoteric opinion about human psychology to explain this five percent growth rate of human resources spending. Uh, people like getting stuff. Um, and uh, if the government sort of sets up shop saying, well, we're here to give you stuff, people um, may be reluctant or re even resentful at first, but after a while come around and say, oh, yeah, okay, well, we'll take some of that and some of that other too, you know. Um, so I, uh, if, if you look at the sort of social and political history of the New Deal, you see that um, um, going back to the 1930s, uh, that uh, one of the big tasks of the um, Social Security Act of 1935 um, was to persuade people that they could become Social Security beneficiaries without becoming welfare recipients, without becoming um, people who were um, dependent on taxes paid by others. This was, um, this was a, a crucial sort of a psychological threshold the New Deal had to cross. Um, uh, and so it went to extraordinarily elaborate uh, uh, um, uh, uh, extent to, um, to uh, set up this um, sort of parallel tax system. It would have been much simpler, you know, to simply if you want to have a, a, a social security system, people are already paying income taxes. You have a federal tax system set up. Just increase the taxes, increase the tax rate structure. You have more money coming in, and some of it you set aside for these uh, social security checks. But it was so important to persuade people that, no, that, that's not somebody else's money you're getting. That's your money you're getting. Um, so they uh, were, were setting up an account where you're quote unquote contributions are quote unquote kept. Um, and it, it had all of the um, 
the um, sort of uh, the, the Potemkin village facade of a, a private uh, pension or insurance system, when it's really just money sloshing into the government from um, payroll taxes and sloshing back out again in terms of Social Security checks. Um, I think that um, that um, the success in that um, venture by Franklin Roosevelt in the late 1930s meant that, to quote the political scientist James Q. Wilson, the legitimacy barrier that had for American history from 1989 up to 1932 had really constrained the federal government, um, had been torn up in a big way. Um, after the 1940s, the new view was that a government could do just about anything it needed to address just about any problem it thought needed to be addressed. Um, so I think that um, in a certain sense as a, as a political society, we've, we've been changed by the New Deal, our, our outlook about our, our presuppositions about what government should and shouldn't do, and our presuppositions about what we must do to take care of ourselves and our family, and um, th those have all been altered. Um, the question about w how this comports with the uh, the sort of the, the America that Tocqueville uh, traveled in and wrote about in the 1830s, a century before the New Deal, I think is also an important question um, and a hard question, and it's sort of a um, it's in some ways sort of a chicken and egg question. The, the, the people who favor the New Deal would say, the New Deal is a response to the decline of that sort of America, that small town, uh, ch um, mutual benefit society kind of framework for, for helping out people who were in a bad way. This was no longer available. It was no longer feasible. It no longer made sense in a nation with cities, with millions of people, um, in a nation where most people uh, uh, made their, um, provided for themselves not by running small businesses or family farms, but by working for giant corporations. Um, the, uh, the anti-New Deal argument is that, um, that the New Deal has um, done more to cause, has, has caused rather than been caused by these social trends to a considerable degree. That because these social welfare programs are in place, um, people naturally reorient their lives and their outlooks on the assumption that they will and should be and, and will be forever. Um, so that in, um, I mean, to, again, to take sort of the, 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 uh, the ideal of what uh, New Deal liberals would like America to be, you look at Sweden, we talk about those, um, uh, those, those uh, daycare clinics. Um, the Swedes pay extraordinarily high taxes. A lot of um, uh, young women with children who really want to stay home and take care of their kids can't afford to because their husband, her husband, pays such high taxes. So, um, so she takes a job she'd rather not take, drops her kids off at daycare, which she'd rather not do, goes and works in a, probably another social welfare function organization somewhere in Swedish society. Um, and the, the, uh, the effect is that um, in a, in a way, it's a kind of a funny outward in sort of thing. This, the Swedish welfare state is a very good vehicle for expressing our, uh, our concerns about distant strangers we'll never meet. But it, it diminishes our ability to express our concern about the people who are closest to us, our kids, our parents, our, our, our family member, our neighbors. The, the, the kinds of ties that would knit us together with them are ones that we don't have the time or resources to uh, um, nurture. Um, now, it's possible that in the next year's elections, next November's elections, especially with the, the redistricting of state legislative districts in California, that um, California Democrats will finally um, get those extra two or three seats they need in both houses of the state legislature to have a two-thirds majority and therefore be able to pass tax increases despite the Prop 13 two-thirds requirement. Um, that, that could be one of the tragedies of uh, getting what you wish for because then 
as you say, in this very blue state that, that got even bluer in 2010 while the rest of the country was backpedaling from the Democratic uh, gains in 2006 and 2008. Um, even then, the, you would, the Democratic Party would be passing tax increases and fully responsible for them. Um, and the, the evidence indicates overwhelmingly that uh, the California people, um, disposed as they are in so many other ways uh, to favor the Democratic agenda, don't favor that part of it. But that part of it, as I've been saying, and as it sounds like you agree, is the crucial part of it, the part without which the other parts can't really be enacted or don't matter. Um, so yes, I, th I think that um, I think that this uh, more than any other thing is is what keeps people up at night at the Democratic National Committee in Washington. How do we change this or how do we get around this or deal with this somehow? this tax aversion. I just got a book by a political scientist, or a sociologist, I think, at UC San Diego called The Permanent Tax Revolt, um, which sort of goes back to, uh, not simply to the, the, the sort of details of, of, of uh, Prop 13, but to kind of the political, uh, the, the, the broader political and sociological uh, um, um, aspects of American society that were captured by and sort of catalyzed by the, the late 1970s tax revolt. It's been a big problem, yeah.